it, it, it was not a quiet stream. But, um, yeah, I, I like feel like the power creep discussion has already been hammered in like so many times in so many different communities. So I am a little bit tired of talking about it. But I'll kind of just like state my thoughts on it just in case we have anyone new here that hasn't heard my thoughts. My, like, no, um, the way that I see it is first things first, we have to set down like something very, very basic that I think a lot of people don't realize is that post secrets of the obscure balance is not relevant to the conversation because every single game under the existence of the sun will always release broken shit on release both intentionally and unintentionally this is not unique to givers too this is true in every game and let me just like name a couple of examples to really drive this point out for so League of Legends is notorious for doing this. On release, usually a champion is completely broken. There have been historical cases where champions literally have like 80% win rate or something like that. And a big reason is because they want people to spend money on it so that they can both sell the skins and they can, uh, what's it called, sell the champion itself. Or anyone that's impatient and doesn't have the blue essence for it. POE has had this before where they release like certain RS stacking builds and those RS stacking builds, I'm talking a single class, a single build dominates over 50% of the play rate of the entire game for multiple months on end. And this is, again, I just really want to point this out because I completely agree that power creep is an issue, but anytime somebody brings in the point that like, oh, Scourge is broken right now or whatever it's called, it's like a, a lie or what's it? Condi, Condi Spectre is like hitting 47k with like specific relics and that sort of thing. I always tell them like, yeah, you're not wrong, but that also doesn't matter. Because the way that I always point it out is think about what ha would happen if they released the new specs and they were bad. Right, or not bad, the, the new classes and like the new relic changes and the new weapon master training. Imagine if they released it and then it was bad. Can you think about the marketing shitstorm that would happen afterwards, right? Because then people would be saying, oh, we got no elite specializations. We're paying $30 for like a half-baked expansion, which some people are saying anyways. Like, oh, they didn't release anything that actually like changes my gameplay, all that kind of stuff. It's intentional. I'm sure they're going to do a blanket set of nerfs afterwards. And the thing is, this did drive a lot of people to learning new classes. There's a lot of people that are picking up Necro for the first time. There's a lot of people picking up Thief for the first time. So it's working. It's generating them revenue, which at the end of the day is every game company's like biggest goal, right? So then after that, let me let me talk about now the relevant side of Power Creep, which is pre-Soto. Pre-Soto in the past year or so has basically seen classes across the board get nearly a 25% damage increase. And there's kind of two sides to this conversation. And one is like, why did they do it, right? So that's kind of like facet number one. And then facet number two is what are they gonna do about it in the future? So looking at reason number one, a big reason is because of accessibility. The reason why they are making all these classes significantly easier to play is because they want being able to play at a higher level be more accessible. That, that is hands down the reason why. Right? And they also want the classes to feel good while playing. And I've talked about this before. It's, it's, this is no secret. Grouch himself has set this under multiple scenarios and stuff. But in this game, there are three primary drop-off points where people stop playing the game. And this is obviously not good for the game because you want player retention. You want people to stay in the game. Drop-off number one is before they even try the game. I'm sure there are plenty of people in the world that have heard of Gyorus 2, but are never gonna play it. Why? Because of many different reasons. Maybe they don't like the art style. Maybe they don't like MMOs. Maybe they think that the game is old. Maybe they think that the game is dead. Maybe they think that the classes aren't fun. Maybe they like look at it and they think, wow, this is like kind of boring. So that is big drop off number one. Big drop off number two is around level 10 to 20, AKA people that gave the game a try because they were interested enough in it, but then for whatever reason, early into the game, they figured, okay, this is not really worth me spending more time into. And a lot of times this boils down to multiple things. So one is the exploration-based MMO gameplay. That's something that catches a lot of people off guard when they play. The second big thing, is the lack of class progression that actually feels meaningful. This is a really, really big thing that especially early Guild Wars 2 really struggles with. Because when you're unlocking the traits, you don't know which traits are good. When you're unlocking the early skills, you don't know which skills are good. And this is a, a lot part because a lot of the skills and traits have multiple purposes to them. And you need to synergize them with other traits in order to make them feel good. This is something that they address with something that they call purity of purpose. Basically, each trait and each skill, each weapon, whatever it's called, has a very specific purpose. And it's very obvious what that is. And because of that, it reduces the need for players to go to third party resources to get that information. So that's already targeting balance change, or the big balance facet change number one, is that the skills 
are easier to use. And this, of course, the unintended or intended byproduct of it is that now the game is a lot simpler. And this is a really big criticism that honestly I sympathize with because I've done a lot of theory crafting for stuff like Chrono. I used to do fractal speedrunning, all that kind of stuff. So it's like, yeah, it lowered the skill ceiling by a lot. But did it work? Yes, it worked. Because if you look at the new player retention after that initial drop off, it is now significantly higher. They have literally said on End of Dragons release, on Soda release, they have doubled, if not tripled, the number of people that are actively playing the game. And a big part of that is because they find the game more fun to play. And that's not just content, because the vast majority of people that are entering the game are not doing end game content. They're doing the base game, they're doing exploration, they're doing map completion, they're doing the early dungeons, the early story, potentially even the strike missions and all that kind of stuff. And now because they can play their classes to a higher level, they're sticking around. So that's drop off number one, or it's drop off number two. Drop off number three is at level 80. Basically when players are confronted with the idea that, okay, I'm done with all of the free stuff now. Is this game a game that I want to spend money on and continue playing? And for a lot of people, that's gonna be no. Understandable? Right? It's, it's like, okay, you hit level 80, you ran out of stuff to do. Do you want to drop $120 on the ultimate edition? For most people, the answer is going to be no. So why do people stick around after that? Is then, is there end game content that they're willing to get into or that they think that they're able to get into? Right? So obviously then that's going to be stuff like fractals, strike missions, raids, so on and so forth. So if you already feel like, okay, I'm like, my class doesn't really feel all that good. And now you're telling me I have to go and like learn all of these different builds from like heart stuck and so cursed because that's what everybody else does. And I have to learn all of these rotations and it's like really hard and it's a lot of work and I have a full-time job. I'm just going to go play the free trial for Final Fantasy instead. That's what a lot of people are going to say, right? So that's all addressing the why of why they made a lot of these balance changes. And again, what I'm saying here, this is no secret. They've said this. Okay, like literally the, the developers have said this. So then you can naturally see how that leads into this power, power creep progression, right? So first things first is that the skills and everything are easier to use, so that lowers the skill ceiling. And then on top of that, they've been buffing a lot of the core weapons. And you wanna know why they buff the core weapons? We need to go, okay, no problem, thank you for coming, sorry. I'm just like ranting right now because I, I, I might just clip this entire section and throw it onto YouTube. So I don't have to keep on like saying it again. But anyways. You wanna know why they buff the core weapons? Because the core weapons are the weapons people are using when they first start the game. It, it, and then on top of that, why are they buffing like the base power levels for a lot of classes? So like for example, low intensity builds like Virtuoso and Mechanist, because people are naturally gonna gravitate towards the easy to play and like really strong builds so that they can tackle the endgame content without feeling like they're go going to be judged. And again, this all boils down to the simple idea of accessibility. People aren't doing raids because they're profitable. People don't do strike missions because they're profitable. People don't do open world because it's profitable. Everybody that always says, oh, you can make like 40 gold an hour with Drizzle World. I can tell you right now, the number of people actually doing that are probably less than the people who are actually raiding consistently. Because in order to hit those really, really high numbers, you need to do extensive material processing. You have to know how to use the spirit shards and all of the materials that you're getting. You have to be actively doing things like TP flipping and undercutting and all that kind of stuff. The vast majority of players in this game log on for an hour or two, maybe per day. They do some open world map completion. They go hit a couple of bosses in Arc Basin or something like that, and then they're done. For those players, they're probably only getting five to 10 gold an hour, if even that. I would argue the vast majority of players are not even hitting five to 10 gold an hour. They're just running around, doing random events that they come across in the maps. For those players, they're probably making two to three gold an hour, which is significantly less than what you would make if you did strike missions or raids or fractals or everything else. But why do they do it? It's because it's easy. They're, they just do it because it's there, right? It's like every, whenever people look at like the things that they're doing, if you look at the things that people are doing, they're always gonna take the path of least resistance. So by increasing the accessibility of these end game things, people are going to be doing it a lot more. And the other example that I use here is like Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy, getting into dungeons, getting into all of these like raids or whatever it's called, is, is exceptionally easy to do. You press one button, it puts you in a party finder, you AFK for five minutes, you come back and all of the work is done for you. There are people that literally just run the same dungeon over and over and over again purely for fashion and it makes them negative money because they're spending their time doing this thing that gives them no money instead of doing things that have money because it's easy to do. 
That is like the core fundamental reason why people don't do end game content in Guild Wars 2 is because it's hard to get into. It's hard to find a group. It's hard to have a build that actually can clear it consistently. It's hard to like, it's hard to even find where these things are, okay? Like, look at all the different strike mission lobbies. You have one in Arborstone, you have one in Eye of the North, you have another one in Soto now, and like, only recently, like literally less than a week ago, did they add a hub for dungeons. For dungeons, if you wanted to do it, you had to go to a very specific location in the entirety of, like, Corteria, talk to a specific NPC, do the explorable mode, or sorry, the story mode, and then you unlock the Like, it's just a nightmare to get into, right? It's just a lot of work. So if there are a lot of work, people just aren't getting into it. So anyways, TLDR, that's my thoughts on balance and power creep. I, I understand why they're doing it, but I also don't think it's healthy for the long term of the game, is basically what I'm saying. As long as they slow down power creep, honestly, like, you know, I, I just realized all of, all of every, I just like talked about all of the why. I didn't even talk about my own thoughts of power creep. So basically the TLDR is with power creep, I don't think it's good because it does trivialize a lot of the end game PvE content in Gears 2 because how do I put this? Let me let me try to find like a good way to phrase it. Guild Wars 2's entire idea is that it's horizontal progression, meaning that when you get to a certain point in the game, you can essentially do everything, right? So that means that intuitively you would think that everything is on the same level, right? So when you think about the different things that you can do, you would expect them, if you are at the similar level, power level, you would be able to do all of it. Nowadays, that's not necessarily true anymore. The power level that you need for like, let's say like, Cosmic Observatory and Temple of Phoebe is very different from the power level that you would expect from the like easy three ice boots alpha, which I think is fine. I think having a little bit of like natural progression in the game because the IBS three were like released earlier than the later ones, I think that's okay. But the problem is, is if you see the degree to which they're different, right? So like you would expect, okay, all of these strike missions, since they're labeled under so, and it's labeled under horizontal progression, are probably within 15 to 20% of the power levels of each other, right? And then you would kind of like expect the same thing again of like, you know, the Path of Fire, like CMs and stuff. Right, so the Path of Fire CMs, you would expect all of them to be within 15 to 20% of like the difficulty level of each other because they're not chronological. You don't need to go and grind higher gear levels or that sort of thing in order to tackle more and more like higher level rates. That's just not how the game was designed, right? But now this is where the disconnect is. If you look at Doom CM, which is arguably one of the most difficult encounters in the game, it has less health than Cosmic Observatory, which is supposed to be one of the easy entry level pieces of content in the game. And obviously there's a lot more that goes into design and like difficulty than just pure health, but it's just about expectations, right? It's like if you would expect, okay, this pinnacle content with this really difficult raid boss with a lot of different mechanics and everything, it's gonna take me a long time. There's gonna be fight fatigue that you have to worry about, but it only has what, 48, 48 million health? And then this other boss over here with Cosmic Observatory, it's like, okay, you only have three mechanics that you're dealing with, but it has 55 million health. To me, that just does not compute, right? Like in my head, that just does not compute. But it is Anet's answer to power creep, essentially. It's like, okay, if we buff all of the numbers that each of the classes do, then the other bosses, like the later bosses that we release, have to have appropriate health for that, right? So it's, it's like, I think Teapot said it best. It's like, with this kind of thing, all there is is just number tuning. Right, it's like they can always decrease the health of like Cosmic Observatory. They can always increase the health of Doom CM. So what actually matters when it comes to power creep is how the encounters are designed. Essentially, even if you had like, let's say 100,000 DPS, like individual personal DPS, you need to have mechanics where that doesn't matter. Obviously, again, this is to certain degrees because it's very different from saying you have two times the damage versus 2,000 times the damage, right? Because that, that's just silly. No, no class is ever going to be able to do 1 million damage per second in like the intended way, right? So we have to think within like, let's say like 200% of each other, right? So a good example of this that I always tell people is Harvest Temple CM. Unless you're trying to do ultra speed run strats where you run a single healer with like a rifle mech that's also doing a decent amount of damage and a single portal person, everybody else is like pure DPS, you're not gonna be able to skip mechanics past a certain phase. So you still have to do the mechanics regardless of power creep. Does it make it easier because you can skip some mechanics? Sure, but you can have a group that has perfect DPS and they will still never clear it unless they do the mechanics, which I think is healthy for the game.
So as long as they add encounters into the game that have that kind of design philosophy, where it's like you have to pass certain mechanic checks or certain heal checks or that sort of thing, then power creep is not that big of an issue. I think a big problem that people are having though is that it doesn't feel like the design is matching that. And again, I think there's a little playing devil's advocate here. The recent strike missions that were released were very specifically normal mode, right? It's like normal mode strike missions across the board have always been very, very easy, very accessible. So what's actually gonna make or break, I think this argument is whether or not the CM versions of these fights truly make it so that power, basically future proof the, the strike mission against power creep. So yeah. Yeah, so I'm like, I'm ranting and stuff. I just, I'm literally gonna just clip that and put it on YouTube and stuff. So, um, yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah. I, like I said, there, there's a lot to be said about this topic. It's a very, very extensive topic. I just wanted to at least get my thoughts out on it and stuff. So, um, avoiding the discomfort of being called out for bad performance. I disagree. I actually completely disagree with that. I think that is a symptom of the problem. It is not the problem itself. It is a by pro it, there, there's a term for this that I remember picking up and I actually really like it a lot. It's an X, Y problem. Y is happening because of X. So if you try to fix Y, you're not actually fixing the root cause, which is X. The reason why there is a pressure for people to perform well in raids is because there's not a high enough population for it. That is. 100% the thing because I can promise you if you go into Final Fantasy and you join a party finder for whatever it's called you're gonna have people that are trash okay like I, if I ever said this while streaming Final Fantasy it would literally get me banned from the game because you're not allowed to use DPS meters in there I'm gonna tell you right now every single dungeon I went into that had newer players aka sprouts and stuff I was doing more damage than them as the healer than all of the other sprouts combined it is not a performance thing that's holding people back in that game. It's because they can press one button, they join, and then they beat the boss anyways, especially in the lower level stuff. And because there's a very high population of people that don't know what they're doing, it's like the, uh, how, how do I put it? It's like the density of the pressure, so to speak, right? It's like, if you only have one person and all of these expectations for them to do well, then the density, per, uh, I guess like pressure density per person is very high. But what happens if you have 10,000 people that all don't know what they're doing, but they're doing it anyways, and then they're having fun. Then of those people that don't know what they're doing, the, I guess, pressure density per person goes significantly lower. So it's like, yeah, healers do a lot. I mean, sure, but then I've also played tank and I've had healers that literally don't hit things at all, right? I'm just using healers as an example because healers do a lot of damage, but DPS should be doing more if they can actually pilot their class well. So again, I feel like a big part of this is just viewer suit population is not that high. Let me take another example here, is PvP. If you look at PvP in this game, the population is ab abysmally low right compare that to a game like league of legends or valor where the player population is extraordinarily high the good part about extraordinarily high player populations is you have more people at every level and it's easier to section like the elo actually matters in those games so when you play league of legends you have a significantly higher chance of playing with and against people of similar levels but in Guild Wars 2, you just don't have that population. So the chances, like the variance of the players that you're gonna run into is significantly higher. So same thing, again, with the rating population. If the rating population is really small, then it's gonna be a lot harder for you to find players of similar skill levels and similar mindsets. That's just how population works. So yeah, anyways. So anyways. <sighs> but there's like five or six more actions. That I actually agree with this, the, right? The, I mean, but that's like what they're, let me actually like point out what you're saying is exactly what the developers have been trying to remove. Like they literally have a term for this. It's called purity of purpose. When you press a skill, it should not be doing five or more things. It should only be doing one thing at a time. And obviously there's going to be historical changes that they've made to the game that go against that, right? So <clears throat> someone <clears throat> who shall not be named <clears throat> did that for a lot of classes on EOD release and it resulted in some very unhealthy classes for the game. I'm pretty sure there's nobody here that would say that that's not true <laughs> mechanism. <laughs> so it's like, 
Yeah, that's true. But that's what they've been doing with a lot of the traits. Like when they rework the classes, they are reworking the classes so that when you press one button, you do one thing. That is the entire point of a lot, a lot of the rebalancing. And again, there's two sides to the coin here. On one hand, it does make things a lot easier and I think it does matter more for the balance of the game, but it also takes out a significant amount of the skill ceiling of the game, essentially streamlining the game, right? It's like that that's one of the really big criticisms that people have of the game is that they are removing a lot of that flexibility, a lot of that kind of like high skill expression gameplay. So yeah, all right, anyways longer instead of us too. I mean, yeah, I mean, again, I feel like this is again the point, right? It's like the balance philosophy on EOD release. And like also, okay, I also need to highlight this because there are some people that, not saying you, I'm just saying anyone that might be listening. End of Dragons took years to make, okay? It's like the balance philosophy when you talk about End of Dragons, you're not talking about the exact design philosophy that existed at 2021. You're talking about the balance philosophy that likely existed in 2017 or 2018. And since then, the game has undergone a radical shift in its balance philosophy. And we've only started seeing that in the past two years or so. So, all right, okay, I'm sorry, I was just like sitting here. We're, we're so ready. Are you guys still here? So, yeah. So it's like, I, I completely agree. I think End of Dragons, I mean, even I can say this, and I'm a bit of an anet white knight. Mechanist was not good for the design of the game. Firebrand was not good for the design of the game. Even Virtuoso completely goes against everything that Mesmer stood for, even if it did increase the number of people playing Mesmer, was not healthy for the design of the game. Why? Because the classes did too much. That is ultimately what it is. They, they just, their class identity was nuked, and because of the fact that they could do everything really well, makes it not good for future proofing the game. <laughs> I'm pretty sure everybody can agree to this, which is why they have been trying to both, both tune up other classes so that they have that level of, I guess, accessibility, right? With like these big OP boons and mobility and CC and all that kind of stuff. That's what they've been doing. That's why power creep exists in the game is because they're not nerfing mechanists down to match the level of other classes, which they kind of did with DPS. But if we're talking about the utility of the class, they're not, removing utility from me mechanists. They're giving other classes utility to bring them up to the same level, which is exactly the reason why power, power creep exists right now. So I, I'm of the opinion that right now power creep is very high because there's a lot of low hanging fruit, so to speak. Like there's a lot of very easy changes that they made that obviously brought things up to the same level, right? So again, core weapons, core traits, certain trait like functions, functionalities and that sort of stuff. Adding boons to pretty much every class under the sun, that sort of thing. These are all very, very easy ways to power creep the game. I think once they run out of stuff to power creep on and as, and as they start slowly adding blanket nerfs to the game, it will be more in tune of what we want. Because again, balance is an iterative cycle. It's not like, thank God, they're not just dropping a balance patch and then going radio silent for two years, which is what they did on release of Firebrand and well, in the in the days of Fire Brigade, right? Like Fire Brigade dominated the meta for three years with almost no balance changes whatsoever. Nowadays, we're getting balance changes pretty much every month or so, and they're very iterative. And like, I'm 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 an Anet White Knight. Okay, I'm a shill. Let, let me just get that out there right now. I am an Anet White Knight. I am a shill. They have been doing excellent work with reverting changes that are not popular. The example that I always use is for example, the scrapper changes, right? Where they had like the wells that kind of moved away from you instead of being around you. Because of the massive outcry and people saying like, yeah, no, that, that like completely changes how you play the game. That's not fun. It's gonna like mess up a lot of things. They reverted it. And, and they've like done that multiple times now where, where it's like people say, oh, like this specific change doesn't make sense. Like another one is like the whole banner shenanigans, right? It's like, obviously that was a massive misplay on their side where they're like, okay, we're gonna put this thing because we don't really understand how to balance warrior, blah, blah, blah. But then they reverted it. I, I feel like that's a really big thing that a lot of people are missing is that the unfortunate reality is that Guild Wars 2 is still acting as if, or I guess developing as if we're in the first like three to four years of the game right, of the release of the game. because And this is in large part because they have been very indecisive with how they actually want to take the game. But now they're finally kind of like, I, I think approaching the game like they should have. And it, it's the classic better late than never, right? So yeah, banners. Yeah, so again, it's like, as well considering what they've done since. Yeah, I mean, you're not, like I said, you're not wrong. But at the same time, I, I am a, a very firm believer that 
Ained has actually been listening. That's something that I feel like they don't actually get enough credit for. And I understand, like, again, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. I can understand why, because they have had a history of not doing that. So there's a lot of people that still assume that it's the same set of developers from 10 years ago that went radio silent after every expansion and never talked about anything until the release of the next expansion, which will always happen like six or seven years later. So it's understandable that a lot of people are not willing to give them the benefit of the doubt. But I am a relatively recent player, I think, compared to a lot of those guys, because I only started seriously playing the game. I, like, I would say, like, at a very high level, right? Probably about four years ago. So I have only seen the tail end of the silence, and I've seen mostly, like, good things after that. At least, again, I'm not saying that the changes themselves are good. I'm saying the way that they're approaching the balance and the way that they're iterating on top of the balance decisions that they make have been significantly better. And I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt. So, yeah. <laughs> no way they will change it back, yeah. I mean, maybe maybe a little bit of devil's advocate here. I actually rather like the new tome changes. It makes it a lot easier to play, for sure, because you don't really have to make the decision of when to use the tomes anymore. But having the, all of that extra utility is quite nice. Though, I, again, I say that not from the perspective of balance, but as a pers from the perspective of fun, right? So it's like, I think that the new changes are a lot more fun even if they aren't necessarily the best for balance, which is again, something that they have to balance, right? Because I think a lot of people also tend to forget this. A perfectly balanced game is actually not very fun to play. Like it, it genuinely, it is actually not that fun to play. Like the example I always give, again, this is a little bit of a derail, but when I play team fight tactics, I think the most fun that I ever have in TFT is on PVE before the set even releases live. Why? Because shit's fucking broken, all right? Like you can just go in, you can, put in nine builds right you can just beat up everybody right it's like it's fun when things are broken but of course that's not healthy for the long term of the game but for my short term player enjoyment it's fucking fun as shit man and then you can also see this because there's one set in particular where literally i think the lead developer his name's Mordog, he released a statement basically saying this is actually like the most well balanced like uh what's it called a well-balanced set that we've ever released like the win rates of every unit was almost perfectly identical but it also had the lowest player retention for that entire set and a lot of people even myself included said yeah that set was just not that fun so yeah anyways tldr yeah okay okay I'm back, I'm back, okay, okay okay um back let's kick some butt okay um what are we missing I know Hexen had to leave that's the DPS. We need two more DPS. Does anybody does anybody want to come for wing two yellow runs? <laughs> Anyways, woo! If I'm allowed to judge after the balance patch, that's what I've held my tongue for. Yeah, I, I actually agree with that. After the balance patch, if things are still really messy and if they like, let's say like, you know, double down on things that would otherwise be unpopular changes, then yeah, I, I think that is 100% warrant, warrants criticism. But I think just again, on release, it's like on release shit's supposed to be broken. Okay, that's the fun part. <laughs> Very good, man. I'm glad! <laughs> I, I, I might literally just cut that entire section and I just... Slap it on YouTube and call it a day. Right, okay, okay, guys, 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 guys. Say hi, YouTube. Okay, okay, okay. Let me, let me, like, put this over here. Say hi, YouTube. <laughs> hi, YouTube. All right, okay. Uh, this is, like, my first time ever doing this and stuff. But, yeah. Woo! Don't farm me. I'm, I'm farming you. All right, yeah. So, ta-da! <laughs> Friends, my eyes light mode. I use light mode for everything. Okay. All right, let's, 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 let's go back to rating now. <laughs> oh, we have more people on YouTube. Okay, okay I'll, I'll let you guys stay over here. Hi, mom. Stop flash banging. Bing, bing. You guys want to see my flat? Oh, my light mode? I use light mode Reddit. And I use. Hold on, give me a second. Light mode Reddit. And I use light mode YouTube. And I use light mode Twitch. And I use light mode Google stuff. And then I use light mode. Uh, what, are, what are some other stuff? Oh, I use light mode Twitter. And. 